Good morning, everybody. It is good to be with you all here. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Uh, it's a blessing to be here with you all. I want to let you know that I know you all going to say it's the rain that's kept some people away today. But I'm beginning to think it's maybe my jokes I tell. So I'm going to have to be careful on that one, right? Um, right, Dave? I've got to be kind of cautious on that one. You never know. Dave just goes like this and looks away from me. He's like, you're on your own. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. As we get into the third chapter, um, I think we're in Colossians for two more weeks after this. Um, so uh, we'll finish up chapter 3 next week with Brother Kevin. And then I'll be back to do chapter 4 um, the next week after that, October 1st. So, uh, Colossians is an incredible book as we've looked at the supremacy of Christ. Today we're going to look at Paul coaches the team. Paul comes up with some coaching tips today. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 14 together. So why don't we go ahead and, and pray and we'll get into God's word. Father God, thank you for your mercy and for your grace. Thank you for the absolute privilege to be in your house. You promise us. You promise us when two or more are gathered in your name, you are here in our midst. So, Lord, we don't have to ask you to be here. You've already said you would be here, and you always keep your word. So I thank you for being here in our presence today. I pray as we worship you. I pray we would do so in spirit and in truth. I pray we would hear from you. Remind us, God, that Pastor Stephan is not the teacher. Ultimately, it is your Holy Spirit who is our teacher. So would you guide us into all truth today? And we know who the truth is. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So I pray you appoint us to Jesus this day. Cause us to leave this place honoring you, as well as being conformed and transformed into the image of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we get started, real quickly, I want to welcome our daughter Jojo. She's with us from Alabama. She's up for a visit. And uh, you all know we're packing to move. So she came up with the sole purpose of helping her old mom, Pa. And uh, it was great having her uh, with us. She's here till, till early tomorrow morning. So, Joe, it's, it's wonderful having you. Um, let's look ahead. Let's get a little bit into our text. Colossians is much like Ephesians. I want you all to know that Paul is very organized, Paul's very orchestrated. Paul is very OCD, very obsessive compulsive that everything you read, Hannah, from Paul is almost like a three-point sermon. I mean, he has things outlined. That's why most seminary students pick Paul to preach their first sermons from because he has already given you the outline, all right? Uh, isn't it cool that God uses people even in spite of our frailties and our flaws? How many of y'all here today realize that you have issues in your life? Yeah. Isn't it cool God uses people with issues? Amen? Uh, you know, I, I liken it, for example, King David, I believe, was bipolar. You know, when someone's bipolar, they can be up one moment, way down the next. Have you ever read any of the Psalms? Larry, there's one Psalm, in one verse, he says, I drench my couch with tears. And within two verses, he's, I sing for joy <laughs> to the Lord. David is all over the place, but man, God used him. Meanwhile, I believe Solomon is much like me. He was ADHD. You ever read Proverbs? Three verses about this subject, two verses about that subject, four, four verses about that subject, two about that. I mean, he is all over the place. But God used Solomon uh, in great and mighty ways. And then we have someone... Um, like Paul, that was OCD. Everything was a certain way. Folks, I'm here to tell you that I don't care who you are. I don't care what your quote-unquote issues or diagnoses are. Um, God created you special and unique, and he desires to use you. And that's exciting. I don't know about you all. The world likes to categorize. Uh, the Lord likes to empower and to use, and he does so intentionally. So I'm grateful for that. So Paul... Like in Ephesians, he did so in Colossians. What he's done is the first half of the book, he lays the theological foundation. And then the last half, he says, okay, with all this being laid, how do we act as Christians? How do we live as Christians? Understanding that, that the supremacy of Christ, 
that we've died in Christ, that everything points to Christ, that Christ is the head of the church, that he is the very foundation of it all. It all points to understanding all that. What in the world does that have to do with us and how we live? Now we go to chapter 3. And I want y'all to picture, uh, and y'all ever played sports or watch sports, picture a coach in the locker room with his team saying, this is what we need to do. This is what we need to do, team. You worked hard. You understand the fundamentals of the game. You understand the sport. You've trained. You've practiced. Now we got to go out and play. And this is what I want you to remember. So this is what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, we, it's all about Christ, the supremacy of Christ. He's the head of the church with understanding all this. And we're dead. We died in Christ, died with him. Now, how do we go out and live that? Tony Evans, and y'all familiar with Tony Evans? Tony Evans says that Christianity, Christians are the only people he knows who celebrate their huddles. Now, now let me quickly say that, share that, explain that. Have you ever watched a football game and a team loses 40 to nothing? And in the lock, when they do the press conference afterwards, the coach goes, yeah, but man, our huddles were good. Our huddles look good. I mean, Donna, man, those huddles, we were, we were together. We were excited in those huddles, man. We may have really lost bad on the field, but woo, we look good in our huddles. No one does that. Churches do it all the time, though. We go out and we live our lives and we lose all the time. We compromise our faith. We don't live out our, our, our lives for Christ. We don't make a difference. We don't look to um, go into all the world and make disciples. We don't live in victory. We don't live walking according to the Spirit. We don't do that. But man, we had a good church service Sunday. That was a really cool worship time. Man, that head coach, that preacher up there, he sure gave a good message, and I loved how I felt. But when we got out of that locker room, we got out of that huddle, we just didn't do a thing to run the plays we were trained for. Paul says, okay, I've laid the foundation. Now this is what we need to be doing. All right, so I want to look at a few things this morning that he encourages us to do. So understand this. This is not about... Rules and regulations. Paul gives guidelines. He says, look, this is how you are to live. I want to give you principles. And if you live by them, God's going to honor your life. He's going to bless that life. And he's going to do so for his glory and for his honor. And I want to tell you, now, if you don't do these things, this is up to you. These are things that, as believers, this should be what marks your life so you can be difference makers. And, you know, so often the Holy Spirit desires to move in our lives. But you do realize that the Holy Spirit... Um, I've always been told, and I always believe it, that God is is the uh, master gentleman. He never forces us to do anything. Scripture says we can grieve the Holy Spirit. Scripture says we can quench the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm here to challenge us today that we allow the Holy Spirit to have his rightful place in our lives and to move and to fill us and and to use us for his glory. So if Christ is supreme and we're born again believers, we've died in Christ, let's live out our lives in a certain way. So let's run through this. We're in the locker room. Coach is coaching. He says this, look, I know life is hard. I know there's challenges in life. I know it can be very frustrating. It can be very difficult. Um, It's very hard to take what we know up here at the gospel and apply it right here in our day-to-day living. So first thing I want you all to remember when you go out today is set your hearts on the things above. Set your heart, set your focus on things that are above. Verses 1 to 2 of Colossians 3 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So set your, set your focus on him. Set your focus on eternity. Set your focus on Christ, not on the here and now. Because sometimes when all you focus on is the here and now and you get your eyes off Christ, things seem awfully big. How many of y'all spend most of your prayer lives telling God how big your problems are? God, I'm overwhelmed. God, I'm struggling here. And God, this is so hard for me. And God, I have this issue with my finances. I got this issue with my family. And I got this issue with my health. And God, oh, I'm so overwhelmed. And really what we need to start doing in Philippians, Paul says we are to present our prayer requests to God with thanksgiving. We're to thank him ahead of time. So instead of telling God how big our problems are, we need to start telling our problems how big our God is. 
We need to focus on what God has, his perspective. Peter walked on the water when he fixed his eyes on who? Jesus. And when he took his eyes off Jesus and his focus was what? The problems, the issues, the circumstances, he started to sink. Praise God, Jesus went nowhere. Praise God, when Peter realized he was going down for the count, he said, save me. And Jesus reached down and saved him. Praise God for who Christ is. But if you don't want to go through a constant cycle of sinking and rising and sinking and rising and sinking and rising, and you want to walk by faith and see God do great and mighty things, keep your eyes fixed on Christ. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. That's in Hebrews, it says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That word fix in the Greek has the focus of literally, almost like a, a, a horse that wears blinders. Where the horse was not allowed to look here or there, the left or the right, but to stay focused on what's ahead. That's how we're to fix our eyes on Christ. No matter how many times the enemy wants to distract us. JoJo, when she played basketball, one of the, right before one of her years in playing ball, when she was training, <coughs> she made me yell and scream at her when she was practicing free throws. Now, Donna, don't be upset with me for yelling and screaming at my daughter. She told me to do that, okay? I don't want you like leaving here going, I can't believe he would do that to his poor kid. But Hannah, she didn't have me stand in front of her. She was having to shoot the free throws, right? She had me stand right in front of her and go, you're awful! Boo! Hiss! Clap my hands! Do everything I can to distract her. And I know some of y'all may think that's horrible, but y- you know why? Because she knew when she was playing the game, and she was playing on another person's court, that it can get really loud and obnoxious and can get real nerve-wracking. She wanted to get used to not being distracted. Folks, as Christians, we have to work on not getting distracted. Because the world, the enemy, wants to distract us. Oh, the economy... Oh, all the, the problems with our country, all these. Now, I'm not saying we're not to take a stand for things that are good, but let's not forget who we are. This is not our home. We have to be making disciples. We need to remember that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are his representatives. Our home is in heaven. It is not on this earth. When we do that, then God does wonderful, mighty things If you're saved today, if you've heard the call of God in your life, if you've repented, you've turned to him, you believe the gospel, it's no longer about us. It's about him. It's about his glory and his honor. We are raised with Christ. Look, verse 1, we've been raised with Christ. At the end of chapter 2, it says we've died in Christ. Now we're raised with Christ. We didn't just die. We were raised. And Ephesians 2 tells us we're already seated in the heavenly places. It's already been a done deal for us. That should impact how we walk and how we live. We should live in humility and obedience, yet in confidence and hope. Have you ever run into a Christian who walks around constantly as if their life was a misery? When really, it could be hard, but it is only temporary. God has incredible, incredible riches in store for us with him. So set your hearts, my friends, on the things above, on Christ. How do you, how do you live your life out? Focus on him, his glory, his will, his honor, his pleasure. And all that becomes our hope. Set your minds on him in eternity, not on earthly things in our glory. The greatest movements of God in human history happened when God's people were eternity focused. And the cancer in the modern church is God's people are focused on ourselves. Me, 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 me. You've heard it. We live in a culture like that today. You ever heard the term church shopping? Or church hopping? Somebody goes to a church... Because they want to find what, they can, what, what the church has to what? To offer them. Folks, that's not what the church is about. It's not about what we get. It's where we can serve and who we can serve and where we can be a part of a family and invest. Again, look, that's, that leads to misery. I'm not going to use terminology now, but we have certain names for men that do that who will 
be a part of one family until they're not happy anymore. So then they jump onto another family, and then they find another woman and another family. You know, they, no, you're committed. Look, you know what makes the nuclear family such an incredible force in our culture? Is when that family says, come hell or high water, we are together. We don't bounce at the first sign of hardship. Amen? We need to stay focused and not about me, me, me. It's interesting. Jesus was in the garden. Remember before he was crucified? Remember when he prayed? He says, Father, not my will, but what? Your will be done. Thy will be done. Notice three times Jesus said, Your will, your will, your will. Satan, on the other hand, when we have a record of him in the Old Testament, of him falling, the record is this. Satan said, I will ascend to the throne of, of, of God. I will be worshipped. I will do this. I will do that. You can tell who your spiritual daddy is based on how you look at things. Is it thy will, thy will, thy will, or is it I will, I will, I will? Oh, my friends, this should be all about God. It should be all about Christ. I don't know about you, but when I seek after my will, I'm never satisfied anyway. It's only in Christ I find my satisfaction. So number one, keep your focus on eternity, on things above, on Christ. Number two, live like we've died to the old life and we look to the new life. Live like we've died to the old life. You don't, you're not tied to the old life anymore and look forward to the new life. My wife and I and Jojo had a dog <coughs> years ago in our family. His name was Luke, Luke Peter. I thought it was a good biblical name, Luke Peter. And Luke Peter uh, was badly abused before we got him. It was really sad. But he, last, he had a few years with us. and um, Beautiful, incredible dog. Black Lab. But we had to tie him to the couch, tether him, like use a leash to the couch when we left because if no one was there, he would be so consumed. He would get into the trash and he would eat stuff that would hurt him. And for whatever reason, he was driven to do this. So we had to tie him. Now, now we didn't abuse him. He had water there. We took good care of him. We were trying to keep him from getting hurt, right? And Luke was so used to that. Now, one day we said, all right, Luke, come on. And Luke jumped on the couch. Leslie thought I tied him up. I thought Leslie tied him up. Nobody tied him up. And we realized that on our way home. We said, you know what? We better be ready to take Luke to the vet and ready to clean up the mess. We walked in. He was still laying there. You know why? He was so used to being tied that he just assumed he was. Christians, sometimes we live in the old life and the old ways in this world, and we just assume it's always like that. My friends, if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you've been set free. You don't have to be tied to the old stuff. You just have to appropriate that. You have to live by that. You have to apply that to your life, that you are no longer a slave. You are now a child of God. You're no longer a slave to sin. You've now been set free from sin. Isn't that beautiful? We, we're not tied to that old. We died to that old life. We look forward to the new life. Verse 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's all about security, my friends, and protection. He hides us. Exodus, 20, Exodus 33 and Psalm 27 tells us that he hides us in the cleft of the rock. He hides us there. So when the storm comes, we can, we, can, we can hover under him and we can be kept safe. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Hallelujah. We have security. No matter how much is going on around us, we can be safe. That song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, safe and secure from all alarm. And then verse 4 
It says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There is something about hope, the hope of being in eternity with him. Have you all ever wondered what heaven's going to be like? Oh, come on. Anybody here ever wonder what heaven's going to be like? <laughs> Complete side note, my dad was a preacher for like 40 years full time, 50 years if you count all his training, and then after he retired, some stuff he did. And my dad was always so prim and proper. Wasn't he, Leslie? Wore a suit everywhere. Um, his first day after retirement, first Wednesday, he came to church, Hannah, and he came in a, in a suit and tie on Wednesday night up to Christ Memorial, Westernport. We all wear jeans and T-shirts and stuff. And after I said, Dad, it's okay to come a little bit more relaxed, dress? Well, I think he was just being sarcastic because the next Wednesday he came in a sweatsuit. So he balanced all that out, right? That was my dad. And I got there. I said, y'all have any questions what heaven's going to be like? And my dad raised his hand, all serious. And he says, son, will there be ice cream? <laughs> my dad, wait till mom gets you home. This is not going to be good for you. There's something about heaven I don't have a clue about, guys. We get little tidbits, right, from Scripture, some really cool things. Scripture says, I actually can't really describe it. Paul says, no eye has seen, no ears heard, no mind has conceived what God's prepared for those who love him. I mean, it's going to blow us away. But I love this illustration. A sick man who was terminally ill turned to his doctor. And as he was, pre as he was preparing to leave the examination room, he said, Doc, I'm afraid to die. Can you tell me as a Christian what lies on the other side? Very quietly, the doctor said, I really don't know. You don't know? The sick man said, you, a Christian man, don't know what's on the other side. And as the doctor was holding the handle of the door, on the other side came this sound that was unmistakable. It was a sound of scratching and whining and whimpering. And the doctor opened the door and golden retriever dog sprang into the room, leaped onto the doctor with an eager show of gladness, tail wagging, all excited to see the doctor. Turning to the patient, the doctor simply said this, Did you notice my dog? He's never been in this room before. He didn't know what was inside. All he knew was that his master was there. And when the door opened, he sprang in, not with fear, but with joy and anticipation. Sir, I know little of what's on the other side of death, but I do know one thing. I know my master's there, and that's enough. We, 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 we cut that stuff from back behind the, oh, we die to that, and we live on to the new we look forward to the new one to come, the new life. Can you imagine what a difference our lives would be on earth if we live like we don't belong here and heaven's our home? Can you imagine if Christians, instead of living like, oh my, uh, uh, everything's about here in this world. I, you know, I, I have a good friend of mine who says this. I spent the whole week with him. He's 80 years old. Marine. He was, uh, he was a corpsman in the Marine Corps. And he said, uh, every time he meets somebody new, they'll say, how you doing? He'll go, if I'm any better, I'd be dead. And when he first said that, I thought, how morbid. And I thought, oh, he got me. He got me good. Because he's absolutely right. Because if he was dead, guess where he'd be? He'd be in eternity. Someone else says, well, at least I'm on this side of the six feet. He goes, I'll never be on the other side of six feet. Because the absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. C.S. Lewis once said, if you read history carefully, you'll find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next world. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think about the other world that we have become so ineffective in this world. Folks, it's, it's all about Christ. It's all about eternity. It's all about that next place. This is only as Rick Warren would say, this is only the minor leagues. This is only the practice time. We got something that's going to be eternal. What's here is just a vapor that's here now and gone moments later. Number three. Can you imagine, though, if the church was all in? 
As Christians, we're all focused on the kingdom of God and not on our present age, how much difference we can make in the present age. Number three, put to death sinful ways, which are not becoming as Christians. In other words, look, y'all need to focus on Christ ahead. You need to look at your past life as if it's dead and press on. And then we need to put to death the sinful ways that aren't becoming as Christians. And not becoming as Christians simply means this. It just ain't right for you to live like this as Christians. There's a certain ways we should live. When I was raising Joe, I would always tell her, I said, honey, I expect you to live a certain way. And, and not because she's my, somebody criticized me once when I said that. They said, why? You, you, you can't expect her to be a certain way because she's a PK, she's a preacher's kid. You shouldn't put that kind of pressure on her. And I said, you don't get it. I never told my daughter she has to behave herself because she's my daughter. I told her she should behave herself because she's God's daughter. Because when you name the name of Jesus, we better be fit, vessels fit for the master's use. We always talk about the, the Ten Commandments, right? What's one of the commandments? Do not use the Lord's, take the Lord's name in vain, right? Use the Lord's name frivolously. And we all assume what? When somebody that, like, like uses the term Jesus in a way that's not proper or, um, you know, whatever the language is. We go, don't use the Lord's name in vain. But I wonder, the word, the, the, the theology there, or the, the language there actually says, don't use his name frivolously. Somebody will go, oh my right? OMG. And we go, no, 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 no. So then we change it to, oh my gosh, right? You know, we change all that because we don't want to to use God's name. But what do we call ourselves in the church? When you get saved, what do we call ourselves? What is that? I heard someone say it. Christians. We call ourselves Christians. Wait a minute. Are we using the Lord's name frivolously when we call ourselves Christians by how we act? I'm a Christian. In, at Antioch, they were first called Christians there because they were being mocked. Christian was not a compliment. Christian literally means a little Christ, a little Jesus. They're making fun of them. Look at the little Jesuses walking around. Look at the little Christ walking around. Look, they're forgiving everybody. Look, they're giving up all their money. Look at the little Christians, how foolish they're making me made fun of. Guys, if there was evidence taken from your life and your charge was being a little Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Or are you just using the name of Jesus, Christian, frivolously? Folks, we, there's certain ways we should live as Christians. Not to become saved. Not to get saved. Because none of us could ever be good enough to become saved. We're only saved by the grace of God. But once we're born again Christians and we bear his name, God expects us to live a certain way. To be his witnesses. Hallelujah. Amen. So how are we to live? I'm not going to go through every part of this verse, every sin and define every sin. I'm going to just focus on one thing here. Look at verse 5. Put to death, therefore. You know, since we're looking ahead, therefore, put to death. What? Whatever belongs to the earthly nature. And he lists some things. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. I know in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, there's the works of the flesh before the fruit of the spirit. But he says, look, which is idolatry? I just want to focus real quick on idolatry today. You all know what idolatry is? You all know what idolatry is? We all think idolatry means that somebody has a little idol and they're worshiping an idol. Idolatry is actually spiritual adultery spiritual adultery. You all know what adultery is, and it doesn't always have to be physical. It can be emotional. Adultery is going outside, how we know it, is going outside of the marriage union to get a need met that should only be met within the marriage union. Does that make sense? That's adultery. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. We go outside of our relationship with Christ to get a need met that should only be met by Christ. It's putting anything above him. Work, addictions, pride, ego, unforgiveness, laziness, gossip, sexual morality, whatever it is. It's Looking out for yourself, where really that fulfillment should be coming only from Christ. That's idolatry. Spiritual adultery. That's why God does not bless us when we're involved with idolatry. 
Now, that makes sense, doesn't it? Think about it. If you're married here today, and you stepped out on your spouse, and you came back to your spouse and expected them to take you back and treat you like nothing happened, you are foolish. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't heal. I'm not saying God can't, can't re, you know, restore. What I'm saying, though, is you can't go around pretending like nothing happened. If I were um, unfaithful to Leslie, then I'd come home to Leslie and expect her to bless me as if I had done nothing. Uh, uh, uh. Leslie would be like, no, no, no. We got things we got to deal with first. I'm not going to bless you while you're getting needs met outside of our marriage, which I should be the only one filling. And we go to Christ, and we're running around getting all of our needs met. And then we come here on Sunday morning and go, all right, God, fill me up. And God's like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> we got some things we got to work on. Because you're running around on Friday nights at the bar. You're running around on Saturdays and Sundays playing sports and have no time for me. You're the one who's not forgiving the person who harmed you. You're the one who's the center of gossip. You're the one bringing, bringing problems to the local church. You're the one who's causing discord among the brethren. You're the one who's greedy. You're the one, you go, all this stuff. And then you expect me to say, that's my child. I'm going to bless him. I don't think so. That's why it says in Psalms, in one of the Psalms, it says, if I harbor sin in my heart, you would not hear my prayers. Guys, the first thing we need to do in prayer, it's called repentance. We got to make sure we're right with God. It's important to him. There's certain ways he wants us to live. And any sin is idolatry because what are we doing? We're putting what we want over what he wants. That's idolatry. Am I making sense? So it doesn't just have to be the sexual sins. And, you know, why does Paul always talk about gossip and backbiting and bitterness? It's because we Christians usually get them big sins fine. We don't go around murdering people. Until the last generation, we didn't go around being sexually immoral either. But now that's a normal thing for Christians to do these days. But, but in that day, Paul's wanting people to understand. It was any sin, whatever sin you're dealing with, when you turn to that instead of Christ, you're committing spiritual idolatry, spiritual adultery. That's idolatry. Moses' last words to the Israelites in Deuteronomy, he warned them when they went, before they went to the promised land, he warned them against idolatry. They went in, and guess what? They turned to idolatry again, and then they had all the problems in the book of Judges. You know, it, it's just amazing, folks, how we repeat our mistakes. It's because of this idolatry, the wrath of God is to come, verse 6. Folks, God does have wrath. There is judgment. I know we live in a culture. Satan's great plan. Can I tell you what one of his master plans is? Is to try to make good look bad and bad look good. And he also wants us to think that there is no judgment. You're okay. I'm okay. Except everybody. It's called love. There's no sin. We can't put someone down. That's just how we're made. I heard a preacher the other day. He has a massive megachurch. I'm telling you, probably five Second Baptists. Um, auditorium like seating I mean packed and he's up there talking about how sin really wasn't sin because God loves everybody and I'm like oh my word folks if sin isn't sin and there is no judgment explain the cross to me explain why Jesus had to die if there's no sin if a guy can go out and commit adultery and that's not sin if you can go out and you can molest someone and that's not sin you go out and rob something, and that's not sin. You can covet something, and that's not sin. You can do whatever you want, and that's not sin. Why did Jesus have to die? Folks, this is what Satan wants to do. His enemy, the plan is this. If there's no sin, then guess what? There can be no judgment. And if there's no judgment, then there's no need for a Savior. And there's no need for Jesus. Get that? That's why the gospel starts. Gospel means what? Anybody know what gospel means? It means Good news? That's why to have the good news, we have to start with the bad news. We're sinners. Subject to death. We need a Savior. The good news is we got a Savior. We all walked in these ways. Verse 7 says, we all walked in these ways. You used to walk in these ways. In the life you once lived. But now, but now, but two important words here. But now, 
Now that you're his child, now that you're born again, now you're part of the church, now that you're in Christ, now that you've died in Christ, now that you've been raised in Christ, now you must get rid of yourself of all that junk. All those things, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't, li- don't lie to each other since you have taken what? Taken off your old self with, the, with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its, of, of its creator. Oh, my friends, take off. There's a principle of taking off those old clothing. You know, if, if I were, um, you know, we at Bruce Outreach Center put up a roof over our Sunday school area. And Larry, I ain't no construction guy. Those guys had to find something for me to do to be productive without messing them up. But it was in the heat of the summer. And you can tell I already sweat. And it's, it's not even that hot. And I'm pouring out the sweat. We work up there for three hours every like, evening a couple times a week. And I get off and I'd be drenched dirty, a wee bit stinky, not really doing that, not looking that good. And then once in a while, I'd have to come home because, there, you know, this is the job, this is the life of a pastor. I had to go to a funeral, to a viewing, a, a funeral home for a viewing of one of our church folks. So what do you think I did before I went out to the funeral home? Real simple, common sense, what do you think I did? Took off the old clothes, took myself a good hot shower, then put on the new clothes. You see, this is what we do too many times as Christians. If I were to come home with all that mess and say, Leslie, let's go to the funeral home, and I left all those dingy clothes on, and I threw, over, threw on myself a nice sporty sweater, and threw on a big old pair of dress pants over my jeans, and say, I'm ready! You know what Leslie would have done? She'd be like, I have a headache. I can't go tonight. <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do this with you. This, there's no way. She will actually, she, wives have a way of doing this, asking questions that really don't need to be asked, right? I come in stinking like as I have and she'll be like, so are you going to take a shower? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm going to take a shower. Because what? That's common sense. But as Christians, we don't live in common sense, do we? We live in the old time. So we live in our sin and we live in our degradation. And then we get born again and we get saved. And we're like, cool, I put on the new clothes, but I'm also going to stay in all that sin and degradation. No, we take the old off. We take a shower. You know what that shower is? That's the blood of Jesus. That's the grace of God. We take what I call a grace shower. The grace of God washes us. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We get that great shower, we get all cleaned up, and then we put on some new clothes. My friends, we got to put to death that old way. We, 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 got to, we got to put off the old. And when we're born again and God washes us clean, we got to put on the new clothes, the new way of acting, the new way of living. Amen? Does that make sense? All right? So let, let's go on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this together here with us, guys. Honestly, I understand the time. All right? So it says here we need to take off those things, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, all the things that are sinful, lying, get rid of all that, put on the new self, which is what? Being renewed in knowledge and the image of the creator. You know, we're renewed in the book of Romans 12. It says we are transformed by the renewing of our what? Our minds. You want to change how you live? Change how you feel. Because we, we, we act based on our feelings, don't we, many times? If you feel frustrated, how do you act? You act frustrated. If you're angry, you feel angry, what do you, how do you act? You act angry. If you feel jealous, you act. And you try not to, but the feelings will influence how you act. You want to change how you act, change how you feel. Wait a minute, how do you change how you feel, Pastor? You change how you think. In Philippians 4, Paul says, whatsoever is good, admirable, pure, lovely, honorable, perfect. Those are the things you think on. Pastor Jack, a dear friend of mine, said that, Pastor Steph and I can get in the car and feel so miserable and so down and so frustrated and so distraught and so hopeless. And then I spend my 15-minute drive doing nothing but telling God how good he is. By the end of my 15-minute drive, I am feeling better than anyone should ever be allowed to feel. How you think will influence how you feel. 
how you feel will influence how you act and how you live. It goes back to the core. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind. So we got to put on, the, take off the old, and then we need to clothe ourselves with what the, our Christian values, especially love and peace. Put them on us. Look at this with me, verse 11. We got to renew our minds now, right? We put on these new clothes. We, in other words, the Bible's filled with, with mind changing, mind challenging, mind changing, transforming principles that will transform your life. So instead of just saying, I'm not, how many of y'all have ever done this? I'm going to stop sinning. <laughs> I'm going to stop doing this. But yet you still struggle because we don't replace that. We don't put on something that's different. We don't look at it from God's perspective. Putting the sin away is only step one. Step two is looking at it from God's perspective. What does God have to say about all of this? And then step three is putting on the new. We always stop with saying, I'm going to stop the sin instead of replacing it and knowing what God says about it. So look at these quick principles that will change your mind, transform you. First of all, verse 11 here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scyth Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. In other words, here there's, there's no one who's arrived, no one better than anybody else. So, so principle number one to tweak your thinking that we could change your life is simply this. None of us have arrived. We ain't all that. None of us are all that. We are not superior to anybody else. And you know what? If not by the grace of God, there go I. You know what the difference is between an unsaved person and a saved person? It's forgiveness from God. It's repenting and believing the gospel. Praise God, someone shared the gospel with you, and God transformed you. That's the difference, not because you're somehow better than anyone else. My dad said the longer you are saved, the greater chance there is that you become a Pharisee. We forget from whence we come and what we've been saved from. Praise God that he, we, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The next renewing principle, it's all about Christ. That was the end of verse 11 right there. But Christ is all and is in all. So it's all about him anyway. It's not about us. That's, that's mind-blowing. Because most of our prayers are about us, right? What we want, not about what God wants. And then look at principle number three. We are not slaves to sin, but we are now God's chosen people. We're holy and dear. We got to know who we are. Verse 12, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with. We are God's holy people. We are dearly loved. Guys, we got to know who we are in Christ. That changes how we walk and live and breathe and act. In the midst of this world, when we know that we are God's child, a holy people. And then, because of the fact that none of us are better than anyone else, because of the fact it's all about Christ, because of the fact that we're God's people and knowing who we are, we need to act a certain way. And we have the listing of things here. Put on what? What's the new clothes? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with each other, forgiving each other. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Look at the things we're to be living as Christians. Compassion. You know what compassion is? It just means caring about others. I can get all, yeah, I can, you can preach a whole sermon just on compassion and the Greek and everything. But just in, for now, for our purposes now, basically it simply means you care about other people. Kindness. You know what kindness is? Just being nice. Christians should be the nicest people on the planet. Sometimes we come across as the, the most um, arrogant people. We should be the nicest people. People should see us and go, that's a Christian there. Not because they're rude and obnoxious, because they're actually nice. Oh, my word, that's incredible. Them Christians I know, they're all such nice people. We should be the nicest people. Gentleness, that means being good to one another. Patience, putting up with others. Even, in the Greek, the word there is long-suffering. This is what it means. Putting up with others, even when they irritate you. Every single spouse knows what I'm talking about here. And no man better say amen because you're going home in trouble. Okay? Every one of us, look, long-suffering, patience means putting up with one another even when we're irritated by each other. We're patient. Forgiving one another just as God forgave us. And then above all, over all these virtues, put on love which binds them together in perfect unity. Because we're in Christ, this is how we should choose to act. It ain't easy. But it's possible. In Matthew 19, Jesus says, With man, 
it's impossible. He was talking about another situation, but the next statement goes for everything. But with God, all things are possible. Philippians 4 tells us that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And Philippians 2 says the Spirit of God, he, the Lord, makes us to, to will and to do his good pleasure, meaning we want to and we can do through him. This morning as we close and wrap this up, I want to encourage y'all, it's all about Christ. It's all about him. He's the head of the church. We've died in him. We've been raised in him. Without him, we're hopeless. With him, we have hope, and we have power, and we have joy. So as we leave this place, set your heart on things above. Having a bad day, remember it's going to get better. Let's see if I get this quote right. I don't have it written down. But, but one person once said, for the believer, this world is as bad as it gets. For the unbeliever, this world is, is as good as it gets. You have a bad day? It's all right. It's going to get better. Because this ain't my home. Live like those who have died to the old life and looking forward to the new one. Have yourself vested in the next life. Put on, put to death that spiritual adultery and idolatry. Take off the old way of living. Stop looking. You know, the reason why a lot of people aren't drawn to Christ is because Christians don't look much different than the world. They should look at us and go, oh my word, how are you living like that? How can you possibly forgive that person? How can you have peace when everything's falling down around you? How can you have joy? How can you do that? A good friend of mine said once that we as Christians, we need to live questionable lifestyles. What that means is how we live should make people want to question us how we live that way. How, how are you able to live that way? Because of Jesus. We take off the old. We, we allow that grace to wash us. And we look at things the way God looks at things. And we put on the new, the virtues, especially love. And that love will produce peace. Look, when the church is not at peace with one another, I'm going to say this is Second Baptist, and y'all going to say, oh, he's just saying that because he knows we've been through a lot of hard times. Uh-uh. I'm gonna, I say this to any church I preach to. I'll say this to every church. Here's an indicator. You ready? Here's a, here, here we go. This is a great little cheat thing. Larry, write this down someplace. Have it on the side for you. You can remember, any time the church is not at peace with one another, I don't mean they're in agreement on everything, but I mean at peace, Right? When there's not peace in the church, it's usually because we ain't loving each other. I'm not saying we don't challenge each other. I'm not saying there aren't hard conversations to be had. But many times peace is not there simply because we just don't love one another. So today, church... Let's be transformed by the Spirit of God. Let, let, let this idea of Christ being supreme in the head of the church and we, being, we dying in him and being raised in him, let's not leave that here as a great huddle. Yeah, great, that's a great play to call. Yeah, let's do this. And then walk out of here and never be changed. Let's walk out of here setting our hearts on things above, taking off that old and putting on that new, and watch what God does with this church. And just in case... There's somebody here that has never trusted Christ as Savior. Just in case. You know God loves you. It don't matter what you've done or where you've been. God stinking loves you. He loved you so much that he was willing to allow his only son to be sacrificed on a cross just for you. You see, we're all sinners, and we deserve to go to hell. And there's a price to pay for that, and we got to pay for that. But God says, no, 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 no. Now, see, I know you all can't pay for that, because the only way you can pay for that is be separated from me for eternity and go to hell and be with I don't want, I created you to have fellowship with me. I don't want you to be separated from me. I want you to be with me. So I'm going to go ahead and pay that debt for you. Death has to happen, so my son's going to do that for you. If you would only... Repent and turn and believe on me. 
today, my friends, if you would do that. Just respond to his call in your life. If you listen carefully, I think you can maybe hear him whisper your name. He loves you. But he honors your decision. Would you decide wisely today? Be adopted by the God of the universe and turn to him this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your patience, for your faithfulness, for your goodness, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. Lord, help us as the church to live that out, God. Help us to put off all that old stuff, even the stuff that's happened to us in this church maybe, folks that are struggling. Help them, God, to take that old stuff off. Have you shower them with your grace, forgiveness, and then put on that new life, God. We live in this world so much and we get sullied and dirtied by this world that maybe we need to take off, shower, and put on every day. We need to keep reminding ourselves who we are in you, God. And I pray, Lord, that you would use this church to impress and impact this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if there's someone here today that does not know you, God, don't let them leave this place until they've trusted you. In Jesus' name we pray.